Pals are one of the most vital parts of Power World, which makes sense since, you know, it's literally in the name. A good set of Pals can turn Power World's challenges into something pretty manageable. However, a weak or non-existent set of Pals can do the polar opposite to your gameplay experience. So what if instead of catching or breeding the specific Pals that we wanted, we went ahead and left it all up to chance? get a nice extra helping of RNG in our pal run. Scattered around the world of Power World are various camps where our cute little pal buddies have been rudely entrapped and mistreated by the various NPCs of the game. And it is our goal to free these pals and bring them to a new life of happiness. Well, sorta. We would still be forcing them to, you know, fight for us and do hard labor in the base. But of course this would be with love. So that is the run. We are going to attempt to beat all of Power World while only using rescued pals. No breeding, no capturing, no purchasing pals, purely just using pals that we can rescue from the various camps. Which means that the complexity and difficulty of this run is basically completely in Pocket Pair's hands. So hopefully, they treat us well. The first thing we would need to do to get this challenge started would be to locate some camps and see if we could get our first pal for the run. However, this wouldn't be an easy task, as even the lowest level camps in the game start with enemies at level 5. So to begin the leveling process to be able to go and take on a camp, we would start by punching some chickpeas and quickly hit level 2. From here, we would punch a few more pals practicing our true inner boxer and hit level 3 in the process. Then we would slide on down the hill and grab the checkpoint at the very bottom. And during onwards toward our first rescue mission, we would have an intense 1v1 versus Kativa. But luckily, we are the superior boxer and would come out victorious. Damn, it's quiet on that side now. Oh! Hey, quiet on that side now, ain't it, boy? We would then walk over to where the first tower boss is located, which also happens to have a syndicate camp right on next to it. And before trying to take on the camp, we'd grab the fast travel location and then give our first rescue mission an attempt. As we got close to the camp, we would see our first pal we would attempting to be saved a nice plant lady known as Bristla. Breaking in and rescuing said Bristla though would be no easy task, as we had not bothered to build literally anything at this point, so we'd be taking on the syndicate thugs literally with just our fists. And seeing how as they were not only higher level than us, but also had guns, you know, maybe, maybe not the best idea. So with the deck stacked against us, we would employ some strats that Sam Fisher himself would be proud of. And seeing as Ubisoft won't give us a new Splinter Cell game, this is the closest thing we can get. Which means uh, we hid behind a rock, and we tried to come up with a plan that could actually work to save the Bristle. And while we were chilling behind this rock, you know, scoping out the camp, Coming up with a good plan, one of the thugs would actually venture close to the rock, so being the opportunist that I am, we would jump out and try and defeat him with a flurry of punches. This though would not go to plan at all, as not only does punching them do horrible damage, a second thug would notice our fight and decide to join in. While outnumbered 2v1 versus just our fists, I figured we would, you know, back off and try and find a better route of attack. But this is when we noticed our chance. On the other side of the camp, while we had been, you know, sneaking around pretending to be Sam Fisher, some wild pals had actually distracted the rest of the syndicate thugs, and we were able to just run in and free the Bristla, who had been left alone in her cage. Now teamed up with the Bristla, we would go back and clear out all the syndicate enemies that were around the camp, throwing some solid haymakers for good measure, and we even hit level 4 during the fight. Though, you know, if we're being honest, I think Bristla did most of the carrying here. We kind of just stood around and maybe threw a punch or two. Bristla's ability, if you're unaware, allows her to buff the attack power of other grass-type pals in your party, which can actually allow for some pretty solid pal comps if you want to go heavy into grass-type pals, especially since the ability can stack with multiple Bristla. This, though, would be a later choice, as right now, we only had one pal, and it was a Bristla. From here we would head on over to finally set down a base so that our rescued friends can have a nice luxurious camp to come home to, and luckily for us Bristla would actually be a pretty solid first pal for the squad, as she would be able to do a variety of tasks in the base including planting, gathering, crafting, transporting, and even medicine production if a pal, you know, needed some meds to cure their depression. So like, basically, Bristle is the big pharma of the pal world, but you know, not the good big pharma, if you know what I mean. Our base location would be nothing special, set at the foot of the desolated church, though we did have a single ore spawn that would come in handy later on, if we happen to rescue a fire type pal to run the furnace. I feel like it's a good time to mention that while RNG would play a huge factor in how hard or easy this challenge was gonna be, 
whether or not we got a mount, whether or not we got someone who could run the furnace, or the various other work suit abilities you'd want in the base. Regardless of what we were going to get, it was going to be a grind nonetheless, as we weren't catching any pals. And the experience that you gain in Pal World from just combat or freeing pals from camps is completely blown out of the water by the experience that you get from, you know, just catching pals. But continuing at the base, we realized that Bristla needed a name like all important pals in our life, and we decided to name her Angry Flower Lady because of her constant look of anger. For now though, without pals to gather materials for us, we would need to punch some trees on our own. That way we could get the basics like a pickaxe and an ax, and after getting those basics, we were able to speed up our gathering a bit, getting enough materials to build some of the essentials for the base. We even built a super fancy house, plopping down four of the wooden foundations, some walls, windows, a door, and a roof, throwing just a mere bed inside, which looking at this masterpiece, some might even classify as their very own McMansion. We would continue working on the base for the next 15 minutes or so, and would even get a visit from the wandering pal merchant, who was nice enough to buy our extra pal spheres that we wouldn't need, giving us a little extra pocket change. From there, we decided to head back out into the world to hopefully rescue some more friends to help us along. Not too far west of our base location, we would actually stumble into another camp and would attempt to get closer to try and formulate a plan. However, unlike the last camp, which was full of level 5 enemies, this camp was full of enemies that were level 10, and it even had the grenade type enemies, which do exactly what they say, throw grenades at you. Now being only level 4, uh, this would be quite the challenge, as trying to engage head on against a bunch of people 6 levels higher than us would be certain death. So we would try and come up with a plan, and we scoped out that the captured pal this time was a Lifmuck, However, you know, as we were kind of noticing this, Angry Flower Lady would get completely destroyed by these Syndicate Grenaders, and this is where we pretty much realized that we weren't quite ready for this camp yet, and we would run away retreating with our life, vowing to come back another day for our Lift Monk buddy. Since Angry Flower Lady was dead, we headed back to the base and attempted to resurrect her. However, without other pals to cheese the respawn timer, we would actually have to wait the full 10 minutes for her to respawn and being the completely impatient person that I am, we would leave her in the base and head back out in the world to try and rescue a new pal. This time we would actually find another one of the level 5 camps and noticed a sad little penguin trapped in a cage. Being slightly higher level this time, we would attempt to just dive in and take out one of the enemies with our pickaxe, which actually does shockingly low damage because personally, if someone was hitting me in the head with a pickaxe, I don't think I would be taking it like a champ like the syndicate dude was. Unfortunately, as we tried to pick off the syndicate enemies, some angry direwolves would show up, and instead of engaging the syndicate dude with, you know, an assault rifle right next to them, they decided that us with a pickaxe was a bigger threat and would aggro against us. Seeing now as we were outnumbered and outgunned, we would attempt to run away, but in doing so would actually aggro another wolf in the process. Running out of options, we would jump down into the water to try and lose aggro, but one of the wolves would actually just yeet off the edge chasing us, because apparently escape just isn't an option, but in a moment of mercy from the pal gods, the AI completely bugged out, and the wolf would just kind of stand there next to us, which allowed us to slowly, and I mean very slowly, hit it to death. We even got a whopping 33 XP for the kill. So with gains like that, I mean, we're going to be max level in no time. Since the combination of wolves plus dudes with guns was a little too much to handle, we headed back to the base to grab Angry Flower Lady, as her respawn timer should be up by now. But also while we were back at the base, we made some clothing, as it was becoming nighttime, and it might be nice to not freeze to death. We would also build a berry plantation to start the food automation process, if you know we happen to rescue a water pal, and we would go ahead and craft a spear to make our combat abilities slightly less ass. As we headed back out to find another camp, we actually stumbled into some mammoths fighting each other. But seeing as they were like 30 levels higher than us, decided it wasn't worth the risk to try and cheese the kill as literally just any of their abilities would insta-kill us. So we would head across the bridge to a new camp and saw a nice little ice gerbil sitting in the cage. With the help of our bristle, this camp would be a bit easier to assault this time and we would free the Jolthog Crist from its captivity. But unfortunately, while we were standing there just kind of dwindling our thumbs, unlocking the cage, Angry Flower Lady would fall to the Syndicate enemies at the base. This though wasn't the end of the world, as since we had already freed our new friend, we just packed up our bags and booked it to safety. The Jolthog Chris though wouldn't be that amazing of a find, as while they were pretty cool pals, I mean they are literally an ice gerbil thing, they wouldn't be all that useful, only possessing the ability to cool things in the base, and they weren't overly powerful in combat, 
though their ability does literally turn them into an ice grenade. We would give our new ice buddy the great name of Sanic and head back to the base to revive Angry Flower Lady once again, which at this point had just become a regular occurrence. This time though, luckily we wouldn't have to wait the whole 10 minutes as we could just throw her dead corpse on the ground and force Sanic to carry her over to a bed for a nice cheese revive. With the squad back together, we would head back out to try and rescue the sad penguin that we had seen earlier and this time we would have a much more successful rescue mission, safely extracting our penguin target who would make a great base pal giving us the ability to water berries. And since, you know, he's a penguin, we gave him the name Mr. Waddles. Since we had now cleared out all the nearby low level camps to where we had started, we headed back over to that level 10 camp from earlier to give it another attempt. But unfortunately, Sanic would get completely dominated by some grenades, though we did get some timing to try and sneak in and attempt the rescue. Here we go, this is our chance. Oh, they're right there. Oh no, I, I restarted the thing. Oh no, oh wait, oh, oh, oh god, oh god. Oh, did we get it? I don't know if we got the pal. Which would have been successful, except during the animation I actually crouched, which cancelled the animation, causing us to have to restart and we would end up dying literal milliseconds before saving the pal. On the bright side though, we were able to just run back in and grab our items without too much of a problem, but this also meant that we wouldn't be able to save Lift Monk at this time. Conveniently though, you know, since we died, we were able to use the respawn point at a different location to get us one of the fast travels on a different spot on the map, giving us access to some more lower level camps to continue our rescue journey. Our next rescued pal would be a Sui, which is an extremely cute pal, but without the rest of the crew, Sui isn't really all that useful, so he wouldn't serve too much of a purpose throughout our run, though we did give him a pretty cool name. Sweet Mercy, which was an idea the chat came up with. I think they did a pretty good job. Our next camp would be one of our best so far, and here we would locate a captured Dummit. These whales are awesome for a challenge like this for multiple reasons, because not only are they ground type, which is very convenient for the first tower boss, they also have tier two mining, which allows them to mine ore, something that would be very important later on. The rescue though wouldn't be totally free, as the syndicate gunner in the camp would nearly mow us down with his assault rifle. But luckily, we were able to just hide behind a tent, which I'm sure would block bullets, and we would kind of just sit there and let Sanic do most of the work, before eventually hopping back out for a few spear pokes. And in a classic Power World AI moment, Sanic would actually just be stuck shooting at a wall, which is just hilarious because it's like classic Power World. But hey, at least we didn't die this time, and we were able to rescue our new friend, who we would actually name Bubbles a little bit later on. But while we were, you know, kind of attempting to do this, a rush roar walking by would decide he wanted a piece of the action and engage us. I'm just trying to rescue my pal. Bro, what the? He went flying. Bro, stop shooting my pal a billion miles in the air. Besides that though, which was pretty funny, he wouldn't actually cause us too much of a problem and we would finish taking him out before heading out from the base. Back at our base, we would actually farm up some more materials and let our new whale farm some rocks by literally just smashing his head on them. And we even crafted a shield so that we wouldn't die as easily when we were out adventuring. At this point into the challenge, we were about two hours in, we'd freed five pals and hit level seven, which wasn't too bad. So we headed back over to that very first camp that we hit at the start of the run over by the first tower boss and basically just decided to check if it had respawned because I wasn't totally sure what the respawn timer was. Oh, oh, okay. Okay, I guess we're getting uh, a lift monk. <laughs> we would easily be able to clear it out and free the lift monk without any issues, but since a ton of our weapons were broken after this, we decided to head back to the base where we named our new lift monk friend Gimpy Gimpy. Lift monk would be an awesome addition to the team, as similar to Bristla, it's a very versatile pal in the base. But also later on, we would be able to unlock its SMG ability, where you literally just pick up lift monk and use it as an SMG, which can be a very useful ability for putting in damage against bosses that also doesn't eat up your ammo. Since we are now level 8, we headed back on over to that same level 10 camp from earlier, and this time we were actually able to sneak in while the syndicate enemies were fighting random pals and rescue our second lift monk, allowing us to now to roll with one in the party and still have one back at the base to help out. This still wouldn't go completely smoothly, as while we were leaving we would just try to fight a group of syndicate for a little bit of experience and completely miss one of the grenade indicators on the ground. Alright, we gotta stop with the grenades, dude. Oh! I'm an idiot. I thought it was on the other side of the rock. After this though, we're now up to level eight 
where we would attempt to run our first of many, many dungeons. And when I say many, I mean it, because by the end of this challenge, I had run so many dungeons, I could probably draw the layouts on a piece of paper just from memory. This first dungeon would sport a daydream as the final boss. Bro, the geometry is pissing me off. There we go, look at that, 520 XP, dude, we take that. That wasn't too bad. A little after this, we would do another dungeon, and we'd actually run into a Chicopee boss, which the game describes as plump and juicy for some reason. And even though we rocked an entire playthrough recently of superpowered chickens, this chicken wouldn't be a match for us and we would easily take it out because in all honesty, Chicopee kind of sucks. Back at our home base, we would upgrade our arsenal a bit, crafting a three shot bow, which is a pretty fun early game weapon. And then we would just go out and grind some more dungeons and camps, saving a second one of the land whales while we're at it. Not long after this, we would actually encounter our first lucky of the run, Look at that art. This would be our first lucky. We are... Well, how long have we been on? Two, three hours? Actually, do you get an extra experience for killing luckies? I've never actually paid attention. We will now find out. Which was a lucky lift monk, but, you know, since we weren't catching any pals, we would instead just murder the lucky instead of catching it, which would give us 259 experience and some ancient sieve parts for our troubles. Sadly though, that lucky wouldn't be the only poor lucky that we would murder during this run. As all good power world runs go, now that we're level 11, we headed on over to our favorite punching bag, Chillet, and easily killed the water dragon, getting our first alpha pal kill of the run and some nice experience in the process. Following this, we would save a floppy, who I honestly forgot that we'd even saved until I was going back through the footage, so that's how much of an impact it had. And then back at the base, we had one of our first raids with an attacking syndicate scouting party. Fortunately though, early game raids in Power World are pretty much a joke, so me and the pals would kill the raiding party. At this point, we were roughly four hours in, and since it was getting pretty late for me in real life, you know, because I'm an old boomer and I gotta go to bed, I figured what better way to end the night than by having our first attempt at taking down the first tower boss, which I was mostly just thinking at the time would sort of be like a barometer check to see how far away we were from actually killing it. While at this point we had hit a couple of the skill trees and gotten some various skills from chess, I hadn't actually bothered to give any of those out to pals because I wasn't sure which pals we would be keeping long term in our fighting party. So we loaded up the party with our land whale bubbles and actually our second land whale Willy and we entered the first boss fight ready to show Zoe and Grisbolt what we were made of. And pretty quickly into the fight I realized that the ground moves of the land whales were way more effective than I thought they would be and that the boss fight might actually be possible assuming we could keep them alive. And the best part of this too is that since they were ground type themselves, they can kind of just stand there and tank Grizzbolt's abilities without even having much of a worry. Just standing there face tanking the boss while putting in a ton of damage in the process. Everything though wouldn't go completely smoothly as our bro would break during the fight with about 5 minutes left. But without only roughly 5k HP remaining on Grizzbolt, there wasn't too much to worry about. We even pulled out the spear and poked him in the butt a little bit for good measure, which probably wasn't even worth the effort in terms of damage, but it's all about style points. Dude, Grisbolt didn't, didn't even put up a fight. Sheesh. And we got 1100 experience from that, dude. It might honestly be worth running it multiple times. Repeating that that was not bad at all. This would end our first night of the challenge, but getting up to level 15 and taking out the first boss on our first attempt isn't too bad for the first night. However, not everything was gonna be sunshine and roses, as to take on the next boss, Lily and Leon, we would need to grind out levels all the way up to level 25, which meant we had a whole lot more camps and dungeons in our future. But for now, at least we could go to bed for the night feeling pretty happy and accomplished. Day two would start pretty uneventful as our first rescue would be another Jolt Hog Christ and then our second camp would give us another land whale which gave us a nice little land whale army. Following this we would head over to another camp that would be full of level 19 plus syndicates and even have one of those dudes rocking the huge minigun but we were actually able to kite some of the enemies away from the camp do a little bit of sneaking around the back and we were able to run in and rescue our first surfing. And you know, since everything was level 19, we just peaced out, only losing one of our pals in the process. Surfant would be one of our strongest additions to the squad yet during this run as not only is he a water mount allowing us to traverse across water with no issues, he's also one of these stronger water type pals that it seems you can get from these camps 
and he even has a dragon type move that he learns all on his own. We would name our new servant Water Snack, and he would join the active adventuring party because, I mean, how couldn't he? He's big, and big equals good in any monster catching game. At least that's what I've been told. I'd even throw down a furnace at the base, kind of hoping maybe it would give us some better luck in finding a fire type pal. And since, you know, we still needed to level a lot to get anywhere near the second boss, we went out and killed the Gummus, who we were able to take down pretty easily, where we actually just kind of stood there and let Lift Monk completely solo it while we stood there afk and then we raided another camp which was actually becoming fairly easy to do and we would rescue a nox nox would actually be a really cool find due to its passive ability that turns all of your player attacks into dark moves which is really nice for anything weak to dark abilities like neutral type pels or conveniently all of the human npcs in the game which you know fill up all the bases that we're raiding so once we returned to the base, we added Nox to the adventure party and named her Chizuru. And I believe this is named after an anime character, though this one was purely an idea from chat and my anime knowledge is like negative 10 out of 100. Since we were still in desperate need of Ingot at this time, we went over to see if we could take out the bushy Alpha Pal who is level 23 because killing him will drop anywhere from 1 to 3 Ingot bars. However, if you've never fought Bushy before, he actually has a really solid set of abilities. The problem with Bushy is he has that ability where he like teleports on you and he's probably gonna mess. Oh, I do one attack. Bro, it's not even worth shooting. Dude, Surfant is going ham right now. Right, let's bring him back for a little bit. Let him heal up. Get him, Bubbles. <laughs> one. Oh, that's the move I was talking about. Yeah, no, he's 23. <laughs> My three attack uh, triple shots, even with a even with a headshot, aren't gonna be. Oh, okay. All right, I'm on fire now. For some reason, I didn't think he would tell like blink through the wall, but he sure did. Okay, this is problematic. I don't have high hopes for the squad, right? Oh, oh, he missed. Well, I guess I dodged it, but I'll just say he missed. Okay, goodbye, Bubbles. It was nice knowing you. All right, we just got to waste some time. One. Yeah, I think we just hit the teleporter. Yeah. It was, it was a good try. At this point, we realized it was pretty evident that me and the pals weren't going to be able to do this as we were just a bit too underleveled. So like a true coward who doesn't fight to the death, we hit the teleport and went back to the base to resurrect our fallen Bubbles. The next big task was to head down to Fisherman's Point in the southwest corner of the map so that we could get the fast travel point allowing us to conveniently buy things like the makeshift handgun, fire crossbow, and even some pelt armor, along with all the various ammos we would need. During our trip down, we even saw some wild bushies, but seeing as they were like level 30, we just stayed, you know, far, far away. With our new improvement to our arsenal, we would fast travel up to the Grintail world boss, and this is the exact type of thing that Nox's passive is amazing for, as Grintail is a neutral type pal, and this allowed us to completely melt it down with our new handgun, easily taking him down even though we we're a few levels lower. This would reward us a nice solid 970 experience, and our next adventure would be another journey to get the fast travel points by the other useful merchants. This, if you haven't done it, is up on the northeast corner of the map in the desert, where you can go and buy a musket and other various goodies. Our next world boss encounter would be Azurub, who was just chilling in the water at level 17, and while this one would take a little bit longer to kill than Grintail, we were still able to take it down without too much of a worry. Right next to this, we would clear out a camp and rescue a Falk, who actually do have a pretty solid combat ability allowing them to do a body slam, but since he's a water type pal, and I didn't really want to rock multiple water types in the party, we would just continue to roll with Water Snack over our new Falk. Our next camp encounter would be one of the biggest breakthroughs we would have so far in the run, Oh yeah, camp spotted, all right. <gasps> Fire pal! <gasps> oh my god, chat. This is this is a game changer right here. The whole the whole game's about to change. We're gonna need to set up a, a farming base and everything. As after clearing it out, we were able to rescue an Arsox, which not only is a fire type pal able to use the furnace, it can also be used as a mount. This was huge, as now we can melt down ore into Ingot, allowing us to progress the base and build better weaponry, 
but we also had a much quicker way of traveling, making literally everything in the game faster. On top of that, being a fire type pal would also be a huge get for the next tower boss, Lillian Leon as being a grass type boss would make him extremely effective. We would name our new Arsox Bullseye and with our new access to Ingot, we would even build Lithmonk's SMG. The first test for this new ability would be King Paka and while Lithmonk himself didn't put in too much work in this battle, Nox's ability would again come in clutch, allowing us to hit King Paka with a ton of dark attacks to slowly dwindle down his HP until we were finally able to take him out, and we even went and used Lithmonk's ability again to mow down a ton of Syndicate rescuing a Vixie from a camp. Day 2 would continue doing a ton of dungeons for experience and freeing another Lithmonk, concluding with our second attempt at taking out Bushy. Alright, here we go. Don't mind me, Bushy. Just let me get some free damage in. Okay, I finally understand that attack better now. There's like a delay when you shoot the makeshift hand pistol thing and I don't like it. Oh! <laughs> I said I understand it, I just let him hit me with it. <laughs> Dude, he's just going to tout over there. Alright, we're ready. We're ready! Alright, that was a billion times easier. Oh, three ingot chat. Holy moly. This would close out day two of the challenge in real life with about eight hours of game time in the game or 17 in-game days. And at this point, we were level 18. The following day, we would get back to the grind. And in all honesty, it was probably the most uneventful day of the challenge so far as we were still just trying to get up to level 25 to take on the second boss. Right off the rip, we would rescue a second Arsox, which was pretty convenient as we now had one for the base and one for in the party. And from there, we went and farmed Grizzbolt again just for some experience. And then we went and took out Catrus, the Alpha Pal, which actually gave us more experience than Grizzball. From there, we would go and raid another camp, rescuing a second Nox, followed by a fourth Jolthog Christ, and we would even rescue our very first Bunny. And from there, we would go down and kill Fenglope, who actually wasn't too difficult, thanks again to Nox's passive, which was putting in work against all of the neutral Alpha Pals. Honestly, the most annoying part of fighting Fenglope is without a flying mount, you have to just climb all the way back up the cliff. At this point, one of the few things that I was still really hoping for from a camp was a flying mount, but unfortunately we just hadn't had enough luck to find one, though all things considered, we had been able to find most of the things needed to make this run bearable. The next camp that we would stumble into would be another floppy, followed by another rabunny, so I guess we were just on a cute pink pal kick at this point. Taco Taco would be next, so at least that was a new pal, but it also wasn't really all that useful. Though I've heard you can build a mean implode strategy with them, I just didn't care enough to try it out. A Mount Chris would be the next pal we would rescue, which would allow us to get a nice little gold farm set up at the base, and knowing how much ammo would begin to cost later on in the game, this would be pretty nice. We even rescued a second Bristle after this, which made it possible to run a grass focused team if we wanted, but we decided to just stick with a variety of pal types because it had been working for us. Though now that I'm thinking about it, I do wonder how strong five bristles would be together if you gave them moves specifically to counter each of the bosses you would take on. Because all the bristles would buff each other up, especially if you use the pal condenser to make them even stronger. Annoyingly back at the base, despite the fact that we had one ore spawn, the whales actually just wouldn't mine it, no matter how hard I tried to get them to mine it. Pocket pair, please allow us to assign pals to specific tasks. This is like the number one quality of life thing we need. After fighting with the whales for a while and eventually just giving up, we went and rescued a second Serpent, which, and I don't know how I didn't notice this last time, but Serpent looks absolutely hilarious trapped in the cage. Not only does it not fit in the slightest, the sad face that it's rocking is actually just pure comedy. Going forward at this point, I think we'll just highlight times that we rescue new pals, as there would be an increasing amount of duplicates going forward, though we would finally capture 30 pals, which means we completed another one of the tutorial tasks. So if we actually found five Lambles at this point and built a pal spear, we could get the tutorial off the screen. The next big step forward for our challenge would be getting our base to level 10, which would allow us to set up a second base that we could use as a mining base, where we could send the whales over to force them to actually mine some ore instead of just endlessly hitting rocks over and over. So take that pocket pair. If the pals won't listen to me, I'll find a way to force them to do what I want. Just kidding, me and the pals are actually friends and there's no forced labor in this challenge, none at all. Our new base would actually have a coal spawn which would actually come in handy for things later on like refined ingot, but regrettably the land mails are only tier two mining and you need tier three mining for them to mine coal on their own. So unless we found a ton of whales and we were able to condense them together, we would sadly be mining the coal by ourselves. 
but hey, at least it's like close to the base and we can just fast travel there. Later on that night, we also ran into our second lucky of the run, this time being a Bristlow, and just like last time, we begrudgingly killed it, though it did give us almost 1400 experience. And I gotta be honest, killing these luckies hurts on the inside. Not only are luckies just a cool thing to collect for the sake of it, they're big, and big equals cool. Plus the lucky trait itself makes the pals way more powerful, so killing them is rough knowing all that you're missing out on. Our next journey would be a free pal alliance camp where we would free our very first Dazzy, who would actually be a pretty nice addition to the squad, not only giving us a solid electric type pal, but also Dazzy's item allows a Dazzy in your party to still help you out in combat, even if it's not the active pal, which slightly pumps up your DPS. But for now, even without that item, Dazzy alone would be a nice get for the element of variety alone. And obviously, now that we got a new pal, we had to give it a name, and since Dazzy has a little hair swoop, we gave her the nice name of Jay Beeps which might be admitting how much of a boomer I am, because I don't even know how many years it's been since Justin Bieber has rocked the swoop haircut, but that hairdo is literally cemented into my brain as it was everywhere when I was younger. We would then venture over to Pen King and easily take him out as he was like six levels lower than us at the time, and fights like this really show how fun Lift Monk's ability can be, as it literally did over half of Pen King's HP alone. This year would end day three for us, and I would sign off for the night about halfway to level 22 which meant if we wanted to try and defeat Lily by the end of our fourth stream, we were going to have to make some good progress leveling, as we wanted to be about level 25 before we tried to take her on. Day 4 would start very basic, just killing some of the various alpha pals that we hadn't defeated yet for experience, including Sweepa, Bronze Cherry, and Quivern, and we would even rescue a Lamble from a camp. So only four more of those and we could actually get rid of the tutorial box. Following this, we actually had some more decent luck rescuing a flame bell, which would allow us to farm fire organs in the base. And we even rescued our first Kativa, though at this point that wouldn't be of much use. We'd also stumble into a few more Dazzy, which gave us a total of three Dazzy, which allowed us to try using Dazzy's ability and stack a ton of them, though unfortunately this was extremely underwhelming. While one Dazzy appears to add a tiny bit of DPS when she isn't missing, Stacking them together and using all three of them at the same time didn't really seem to add any extra firepower, and if anything it just hurt the squad as our comp became extremely one dimensional. We would also go on and kill Felbat just for the heck of it, and at this point we were making solid progress through level 22, and just needed a few more levels to try and take on Lily. So we would go and clear a few more of the alpha pals like Doomed, but right after this we would actually run into another group of Mamorous fighting, and this time, since we were a little bit higher level, we decided to jump in and try and get some experience when they were low on HP. This was a huge disappointment though. As we were able to get credit for the kills on both of them without dying or anything, the experience gain for this was absolutely horrible. Nightwing would be our next target, and again, the Alpha Pal didn't pose too much of a threat to our squad of rescuees, if that's a word, I don't know. And back at the base, we had finally craft the rare crossbow sigmatic that we had found from one of the billions of dungeons that we had done. The rare crossbow actually does 406 damage a shot, which is actually pretty cracked, since that's more than the makeshift handgun that we were using up to this point, and arrows are way easier to get than the coarse ammo that the handgun required. Next up would be something that would pose an actual challenge to us, and that was Bron Cherry Aqua, who was sitting at level 30. And even with our new fancy crossbow, Bron Cherry would wipe our entire squad of pals. All right, he's at 80. Oh no. Oh no, he's so close to dying. No, he's doing that stupid health regen move. No, no. Oh, we got it. We got it. We did it. That was worth 4,000 XP. Warsec would be our next foe, and while he didn't pose as much of a threat as Broncherry, it did take quite a bit of time to grind down his HP, and at this point we were just one level away from being ready to take on the boss. During this time we would also craft a musket to try it out, and honestly, I started to really like the musket. We even found a friend for our Mal Chris at the base rescuing a regular Mal to accompany in its gold digging escapades. Now needing only a little bit more experience, we would go and clear out the Patilia Alpha Pal, who stood no match at all for Bullseye the Arch socks which boded very well for our future boss fight as just like Patilia, Lily would be rocking a grass type pal. This would actually be the first alpha that we would test the musket on and like I said I was really starting to like the musket even if it shot way slower than the crossbow. I didn't do the math or anything so I imagine the crossbow actually does do more DPS if you're constantly hitting your shots but that slower feeling of just chunking out large amounts of damage using the musket and getting headshots in the bosses is actually pretty satisfying. Killing Patilia did in fact get us to go up to level 20 
25, and we were now ready for our first encounter with Lily and Leon. At this point, I wasn't sure if we needed to rock a full fire team or if we should just feed fire moves to the various pals, but I figured before making any drastic changes to the squad, we would just go as is and see how it goes. But before being able to do that, we actually had to scale a ton of mountains just to get up to the boss location, and eventually we would make it up there without too many issues, besides, you know, just a little bit of travel time and being a little chilly. I mean, at least I would assume it would be freezing if I was wearing this fit in the snow. Entering the boss fight, we would instantly get off to a strong start, as the musket was chunking and Arsox was going hard, putting in tons of damage and getting some good fire dots on top. However, being our only fire pal meant we needed to make sure that he stayed alive during the fight as he was going to be a good portion of our DPS to take her down. And only a minute or so into the fight, we were melting down her health. Along with Arsox, we did have Liftmunk's ability, which would still do some pretty solid damage off of cooldown. But besides that, most of the other pals weren't going to be hitting Lily and Leland for too crazy of damage. We would continue on for a while rocking the other pals so that Bullseye could heal up a bit, but around the 7 minute mark we would send Bullseye back out to do what he does best. Ram things and set them on fire. Unfortunately some badly managed pal training meant that Arsox would actually take a bunch of damage from hits that should have been easily avoidable if I had pulled him back and with about 6.5 minutes left Bullseye would actually die to one of her ground moves. This meant we had about 60% of the time remaining on the boss fight with the boss sitting at about 50% HP. So it was going to become a race against the clock to see if we could defeat her in our first attempt. Our next pal to fall would be Arnox with about 3 minutes left, but with the boss only having 13,000 remaining HP, it seemed very doable for us to clear out this tower on the first try. Oh my god, I'm missing the headshots right now. The most important headshots of my life. Why did those go through the wall? I don't, I don't get the, some of the abilities in this game. did it Whew. now I only have to grind like endless amounts of more hours to be able to do the next boss currently we're sitting at about 18 or so hours of playtime which isn't too bad of progress considering I think I was like 30 plus hours deep in the last run before defeating the second boss but I think there is a good point to end this first video I do plan on completing this challenge if you guys are interested so just let me know in the comments other than that I hope you enjoyed the video I want to give a huge shout out to all these supporters over on patreon if you want to support out the channel go ahead and check that out besides that I just want to thank you again for watching and hopefully I'll see you again soon